Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. The real problem that faces marketers is a lack of influence. But this is actually much more pervasive than just within a business. It actually applies to the world at large. Some of you may have seen my talks at TED. And in TED, I asked this question. In the UK, we built a special railway track for these trains between London and Folkestone on the coast. And it cost £6 billion, about $9 billion, and it reduced the journey time to Paris from about three hours, three and a half hours, to about two hours, 40 minutes. <laughs> now, I just asked the question. I said, you know, obviously, you know, you know this is at least theoretically an improvement. Um, but is that really the best use you could have made of, of £6 billion to reduce the journey from three and a half hours to two hours, 45 minutes or so? Actually, no, I spoke to the marketing director of Eurostar. He quite frequently gets complaints from people who say, we actually preferred it when the journey lasted longer. <laughs> now, if you think back to the last train journey you ever made, everything about it was a nightmare. Getting up in the morning, getting in your car, driving to the station, finding a place to park, buying a ticket, and finding a seat. All of that stuff was a nightmare. But actually, sitting on the train and looking out of the window is quite nice. It's really not that bad. So you have to ask the question, why, when you have a budget of £6 billion to improve train travel, do you spend it reducing the duration of the only part of the journey that isn't crap? <laughs> now, I made, I made a few points. Um, one of which is that if you'd, if you'd actually adopted what I'd call a human-centred um, solution to this problem, not an engineering-centred solution to this problem, the first thing you would have done, which has still not been done, there is still no Wi-Fi on the trains. Now, I would argue that improving that journey from Paris to London would have been vastly greater in terms of cost-effectiveness, actually in terms of absolute benefit, by installing Wi-Fi versus making it a bit faster. Apart from anything else, Wi-Fi would give you a direct point of competitive advantage with the airlines. You can't use Wi-Fi when you're in the air yet. And it will be years before that arrives on short-haul flights. I also made a frivolous suggestion, saying if you put a creative team in and said you have a marketing budget of £6 billion, how would you like to actually improve the customer experience of that journey? You could have actually spent a £1 billion hiring all of the world's top male and female supermodels, <laughs> getting them to walk up and down the train handing out free Chateau Petrus to all the passengers, <laughs> you'd still have £5 billion left in change, and people would ask for the trains to be slowed down. <laughs> um, what's going on here? I think what we see is we see a world, and it's partly a product of things like the spreadsheet, the numerical expression of everything, where engineering solutions, mechanistic solutions, mathematical solutions, accounting solutions, are preferred over psychological solutions. There are some great exceptions. The single best thing the London Underground Railway ever did to improve passenger satisfaction per pound spent didn't involve a single extra yard of track. It didn't involve a new train. It didn't involve hiring anybody or um, changing the way the trains ran. All they did was they put dot matrix display boards on all the platforms telling you how long you had to wait for the next train. That's a very, very good psychological solution. And it's a very good solution because someone asked the question, what is bad about waiting? Only a tiny component of what's bad about waiting is actually the duration or the wait. The worst part by far is uncertainty. Most of us would rather wait nine minutes for a train and watch the clock tick down, knowing there will be a train in nine minutes, than stand there on a platform you know, even if the trains come every six minutes, in a state of complete anxiety and uncertainty about whether the trains are going to arrive at all. And that's what I call a psychological solution. It's a solution which effectively is arrived at by taking a problem and starting with the human and working out. An engineering solution starts with the engineering and then imposes it on people. 
Now, that's not to say all engineering solutions are wrong. Engineering solutions are often great. But unless you actually consider what is actually important to people in any enterprise, rather than trying to express this in some sort of numerical form, such as punctuality or frequency or duration, you may actually adopt solutions which are inordinately more expensive than they need to be. Quite often, psychological solutions, sometimes called psych hacks by software, software designers, are actually both inexpensive and spectacularly effective. If you like, the equivalent of putting dot matrix display boards on, a, on, a, on an underground station platform is the loading bar in software. That understands that people who actually can see something happening are basically in a state of you know, pleasant anticipation. If you click on something and nothing happens, you're in a state of complete chaos and anxiety. One entity, one, one object that shows the influence of engineers over psychologists is the DVD player. There are several really nasty things about the DVD player, but if you read... How, how many people have read Nudge here by Thaler and Sunstein? If you read a book on good behavioural economics, it will say that, um, for example, choice architecture is important. Making choice easy is an extraordinarily important thing if you want people to act. Broadly speaking, if you present people with uncertainty or ambiguity or confusion, they don't, they don't solve the problem by working harder at it. They solve the problem by not making a decision at all. Um, so if you, if you go home now and look at your DVD remote control, what you will see is about 40 buttons, 30 of which you have never used. Okay? Yet they are the same size as buttons that do things that, like functions like play, for example. There's a second great piece, which is defaults. You know, anticipate what the person is intending to do and make that the natural course of action. Again, the DVD player does not do that. When I put a DVD into my machine, a fairly reasonable assumption is that I want to watch it. <laughs> but does the machine just start playing? No. It has to take me to a completely unnecessary menu screen, which asks me, I suppose you probably want Estonian subtitles. You know, do you want to see an obscure bit of film footage you know, where the key grip or the best boy narrates the making of the film? No, I want to watch the film. But no intelligent assumption is made there. It instead poses a stupid series of questions which only lead you to realise that you've actually lost the remote control and therefore uh, are almost stymied. The third thing, and the worst thing of all, is that if you want people confidently to make decisions, the speed of feedback... That's why the loading bar is so important, is vital. I think we've all done this, haven't we? You press the eject button on a DVD and nothing happens. <laughs> For about three seconds, nothing happens. So your brain assumes, I can't have pressed it properly, so you press the button again. At which point, the DVD emerges from the machine, <laughs> taunts you briefly with its presence, and then disappears back inside again. This is an example of engineers put to design an object and not people with some psychological understanding. If the simple button, the eject button, simply went beep when you pressed it, the whole problem would be solved and an enormous amount of irritation would be avoided. But we have to realise that as marketers, because we don't have you know, a science that's as perfect of, as physics, and nor will we ever have a science as perfect as physics. We, after all, deal with human beings. We must, must realise that that does not make what we do subordinate to people who work with spreadsheets all the time. I'm very against marketers using the phrase accountable to describe marketing. What accountable actually suggests is that you will spend the rest of your life, if you seek to be accountable, grovelling to people in finance and attempting to justify yourself. Accountable is what the guy who buys the paper cups for your company seeks to be. Okay? What it doesn't give you is any influence. It merely gives you the right to do some marketing another day. You will never actually win by being accountable. You will simply not lose. In some ways, marketers becoming accountable is, very appropriately for this location, is an example of what you might call Stockholm Syndrome. 
Now, do you, do you actually have Stockholm Syndrome in Stockholm? I need to check this first. You do? Okay, good. This is when people who are actually hijacked or abducted start to take on the language and beliefs and systems of the people who are abusing them. And to some extent, marketers being accountable is an example of Stockholm Syndrome. It's simply adopting the language, rather pathetically, of the people who are giving you a hard time. Now, what we've got to remember is that we must not be apologetic in the presence of people who have seemingly scientific mathematical uh, approaches to doing business or life. We must keep it in our minds that maybe we're right and they're wrong. I'll give you an example. Engineers aren't perfect. Here are five uh, university faculties. You have to spot the one where nearly all the suicide bombers come from. Um, Islamic studies comes in a very, very distant second. Number one by miles is engineering. <laughs> I'll give you a bit of evidence of this. Uh, if you want this, uh, Umar Farouk uh, Abdul Muttalib uh, was a mechanical engineer. Uh, Mohammed Atta was an architectural engineer. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed got his degree in mechanical engineering. Two of the three founders of Lakshai Taibi, who are the group behind the Mumbai attacks, were actually professors at the University of Engineering and Technology in Lahore. Osama bin Laden came from an engineering family and studied architectural engineering. And in Egypt, the Islamic Brotherhood are popularly known as the Engineers Union because so many of the people there are actually former engineers. Now, why is this? Two sociologists called uh, Gambetta and Hertog um, actually investigated this. Because if you think about it, in Bayesian statistical terms, if you want to improve airport security, don't bother with things like ethnic profiling or, uh, you know, or, or actually looking at someone's national identity before you allow them to board a plane. Just ask what they studied at university. <laughs> and if it's engineering, rubber gloves on, basically. <laughs> um, but the reason is, actually, that engineers have developed a mindset that disdains ambiguity and compromise. They develop a sort of passion to bringing a semblance of order and lack of ambiguity to society, and therefore they adopt, effectively, a completely un-Islamic approach to the teachings of Islam which is they're drawn to an absolutist interpretation of Islam because that seems to apply the same rigor to leading your everyday life as they would like to see in an architectural diagram or an engineering diagram. It's actually not a great mindset, not in a world of uncertainty where people are actually unpredictable, where people behave in ways that are counterintuitive. It's not a great way of understanding the world unless you want to blow it up. Um, now, I believe there is a way of accommodating these things. And the first thing is that we have to develop, I suppose I'd call it a new science of our own. I don't think it's enough, I don't think it's enough to defend ourselves as being accountable. I don't think it's enough to say, look, we did this marketing and it made this much money. Let me explain why psychologically. If there's one thing the scientific and rational mind really, really hates, it's something that works when they don't know why. Doctors don't love the placebo effect, they hate it, okay? The fact that the colour of a pill has more effect on whether patients get better than actually what's in the pill. Doctors don't go, oh, that's great, we can use this. They absolutely despise it because we hate things that we don't understand. And the problem that marketing has is it hasn't ever developed... And actually, the previous speaker from biology is absolutely right in this. There's a whole academic area of research going on into human behavior and psychology, which weirdly has actually failed until very recently to actually uh, reach out and actually forge links with, with marketing within business. My belief, though, is that the real sweet spot lies not in just being pure psychologists about everything, it's in actually the overlap between these three fields. Technology, psychology and economics. The things we do have to make money, I'm not disputing that, but you can do things which, for example, are technologically and economically sensible, and they may work, they probably won't be utterly stupid. But actually, if you overlay psychology, it's when you get the three working together that you really get something beautiful and tremendous. I'll give you a small example of this first. In 
the National Health Service in Britain, which is free, you can't punish people, because it's free, for not turning up to a doctor's appointment. So many, many hundreds of thousands of people every year miss doctor's appointments, consultants' appointments, which costs the health service an enormous amount of money. So the health service decided to solve this problem, and what they did is they put posters up in doctor's surgery saying, last week 46 people missed their appointment in this surgery, don't be one of them. Okay? That's terrible. The reason it's terrible, there's two reasons. One, behavioural science teaches you that if you establish a bad behaviour as being common or a social norm, it reduces the stigma that attaches to it. So people read that and subconsciously they say, well, if 46 people missed their appointment last week, well, it won't make much difference if I make it 47. If you actually make bad behaviour seem common, not rare, it actually increases the incidence of bad behaviour. The second thing that's awful about that is the media placement. You're putting that message in doctor's surgeries where the only people who see it are people who've turned up to their doctor's appointment. <laughs> it's rather like that strange... I don't know if anybody's worked with a train company in advertising, but they, they have one, always have a wonderful idea about getting people to use the trains. So you do lots of ads saying, use the trains, they're wonderful, and then because the media placement is cheaper, the only place they run your ads is on the platforms of railway stations. Now, if you actually adopt technology and economics in this case, one of the things you can do is you can send a text message to people the day beforehand reminding of their, them of their appointment. And that works. But an even better way, and this is when you add psychology, is to say, um, uh, you, we, you have an appointment uh, set tomorrow at 10 a.m. Please confirm that you will be attending by replying with the word yes. The reason is that psychologically, if we enact an action as a commitment device, it makes it much more likely that we'll follow through on that action than if we've simply been fed information. There's a huge difference between the two. Some of you may have noticed recently that when you go to the dentist, or even to a hairdresser, when they fix an appointment card for, the, for your next appointment, they don't fill it in for you, they give you a pen and a card and get you, down to, get you to write the appointment down yourself. And the reason is that that, in psychological experiments, has been shown to actually greatly increase the likelihood that you'll actually turn up. If even, an, even a trivial action like writing the date down is more likely to follow through to the significant action than simple information. I think as marketers, we fetishize information provision as a form of persuasion. And again, I think biology, we're very, very good on this. The greater part of our decisions take place at a subconscious level where we may not even have access to uh, the reasons behind our decision. To give you an example of how information may have very, very little effect on behaviour, as a French doctor, you are no less likely to smoke than any other member of the French population. So you have all the information you could ever need in statistical terms, and you understand it about the detrimental effects of tobacco, but it doesn't affect your behaviour at all. Now, I did point out there is an incentive, of course, that as a smoking French doctor, you are the sexiest man in the world. <laughs> so. If you imagine walk into any bar, hello, I'm a doctor, I imagine it works pretty well. So there must be compensations. <laughs> However, in terms of actually limiting their consumption of tobacco, information, knowing about the problem, doesn't affect things. The reason, as indeed biology will tell you, is that the part of our brain, our brain works really like an Intel dual, dual core processor. There's the subconscious bit, which is millions and millions and millions of years old and is shared by higher primates, mammals, more or less anything else, lizards. That is the decisive part of the brain. It is much more quick-acting than our consciousness, and it is much more decisive. However, it is mostly preoccupied with the immediate now. It's that part of your brain, don't give it a hard time, which stopped you being hit by a bus 15 times in your life, because, sensibly, it got you to jump out of the way rather than doing mathematical calculations about the speed of the bus or statistical calculations about how likely the bus is to actually hit you. It's that part of the brain with which you catch a ball. It's also that part of the brain which decides to have the next cigarette. And it, in many ways, preempts the part of the brain which we believe, erroneously, makes the conscious decision. Now, I said... I said I love the interplay between psychology and technology. 
Here's just an example of the brilliant work you can do, I think, if you put the three to work together. And this is the kind of thing we need to be doing. It's using technology to delight, charm, entice. It's not using technology to come up with solutions which are then imposed on people to create even greater levels of discomfort than we had before. But the problem is marketing is lacking in influence. We don't have a scientific vocabulary that actually carries weight in a boardroom. And I'll explain a little bit of the problem about marketing vocabulary going forward in a minute. Um, the other problem we have is our models of human behavior and how we influence them were okay for the television age. They were okay for mass market products, which involved a relatively small amount of behavioral change, in many cases moving your hand two feet to the right in a supermarket, that, was, you know, um, that, were, that were marketed through mass media. The models were all right. They weren't perfect, of course, but there's a great phrase in economics, all models are wrong, but some of them were useful. And the model we had was useful. It, wa it wasn't perfect, but it was at least useful. In the internet age, when so much communication can be contextual, it can be on demand, it can be time specific. In the case of mobile, the communication can be place specific. The simple models we had of how marketing should work were not wrong necessarily, but they're totally inadequate. They might tell you how to run a, t you know, a, a flight of TV commercials, they don't tell you how to design a website. They might tell you how to sell soap powder, but they don't tell you how to get someone to give up smoking or how to get someone to change their broadband provider or how to get someone to take out life insurance. Within their range, the model was all right, but it was a very narrow range. The third problem I have is that marketing doesn't really have first principles, by which I mean is if you get stuck in a physics problem, if you get stuck in a math mathematics problem, we all know there are certain first principles you can go back to and then start again. We don't really have those. Now, our job description, I think, is really easy. I think a marketing job description, whether you're a copywriter in an ad agency or a planner or a researcher or a marketer in a client's uh, company, a brand manager, it's simply to turn human understanding into business advantage. Your job is to understand people and how uh, their behavior or attitudes can be changed to better serve the needs of your business and vice versa, incidentally. I think this also applies backwards. Your job is also to understand business well enough to understand how you can actually better create value for your customers. Uh, the raw materials are insight and imagination. That's all you need. You need to, you know, insight into customers and how they behave and enough imagination to turn those insights into something that can actually work and run and affect things. The problem I think we've had as well is that we don't and this is particularly true of agencies, we don't generate our own insights. We've got to go out and we've got to wait as an agency. You've got to wait for someone to come to you and say, I've got this problem before you can actually act. So it's rather like the shoe repair shop. The shoe repair shop can repair shoes, but it can't actually provide its own leather and make shoes and sell them in advance. If we had a better science of human understanding, it would be like discovering a source of our own leather. We could actually make solutions in advance of being asked. Now, for an advertising agency in particular, that, that business of being able to go to your clients and say, we've looked at this issue of yours this way, and we think you could do this, rather than waiting to be brought specific marketing tasks, seems to me to fundamentally change the nature of the business you, you can have and the relationship you have between agencies and clients. And I truly believe that behavioral economics, uh, a science which I'll describe to you a little later, provides us with tools to auto-generate our own insights. It provides us with some fundamental principles about human decision-making and behavior and preference, which we never had before. 
I'd almost call this praxeology rather than uh, behavioural economics. This was a word used by Ludwig von Mises, the Austrian school economist. He believed, interestingly, he grew up as an economist in Vienna at the time of Freud, and very interestingly, what the Austrians believe is they believe that actually economics is only a subset of psychology. They believe above economics is a prior senior discipline called praxeology, which is the understanding of human action. And they believe, actually, that economics is simply the study of human praxeology under conditions of scarcity. So they actually believe that, that psychology is the prior discipline. We grow up in a business culture obsessed with shareholder value, numerical expression of everything, which believes that actually psychology has to be subordinated to economics. The Austrians believed absolutely the other way around. The problem is, is that the language we've adopted as marketers is exactly like the language of astrology, which is it's very good at talking to fellow believers, but it's absolutely hopeless at translating to anybody else. You know the language of astrology. I, I, I mean, if anybody, you know, if you've got two astrologers in a room, they can go to each other and go, oh, his behavior is typically Taurus, you know, and they can chat away for ages in a perfectly, to them, sensible conversation, which to them makes perfect sense. The second that conversation is overheard or presented to someone who does not believe in astrology, it sounds like complete bullshit. You might as well go to your chief executive and say, trust the future of your business to the power of the crystal. <laughs> you know, that's about as potent as marketing language is in a boardroom, because it doesn't actually have a scientific framework or first principles. I know about the problem of astrology very well, because my brother's an astronomer. He's building a telescope in Chile, and occasionally at parties, people say, what do you do? He says, I'm an astronomer, and they reply, that's very interesting, I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> um, this is not fun for him at all. <laughs> but if we could develop a new vocabulary, and I, 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 again, a nod to biology, if we can actually tap into the work that's now going on in universities, which is actually validating and providing a scientific language for much of the stuff that we already instinctively know, then we can elevate the role of marketing and psychology within board decision-making to a level where it at least gets a look in. It at least has the chance to, you know, utter a word or two. Now, where do you find this language? Well, the best books about advertising aren't about advertising. That's a Jeremy Bullmore quote, and the other one's from Howard Luck Gossage, uh, which is, uh, whoever discovered water, it wasn't a fish. We won't find this within our own, uh, within our, our own particular community. But there is another community out there, which has existed for a time. It's worth remembering that uh, that David Ogilvy, Bill Burnback, Howard Luck Gossage, you know, perhaps the three giants in their different ways of the American advertising scene in the 50s and 60s, all three of them were wannabe academics. They were actually more interested in sociology, in a sense, than they were in, in, you know, in, in, in pure advertising. David Ogilvy wanted to move Ogilvy and Mather to Princeton from Manhattan because he preferred the academic... Uh, of environment there. It was only his business partners who prevented him from doing this. Burnback was absolutely fascinated by psychology. And weirdly, as both marketers and advertising people, we've lost this link. Now, we weren't much helped by psychologists who spent a lot of their time debating whether or not you fancied your mum, uh, which is, you know, quite interesting in its way, but it doesn't help you sell toothpaste, to be absolutely honest. Uh, I hope not, anyway. Uh, <laughs> New Oedipus brand. No, anyway, but um, finally, I think we can look at areas like behavioral economics, Darwinian psychology, and actually develop a language and a framework and a way of looking at the world, which won't be perfect, but it will lead us to new and interesting places. That's the first value of any framework. It takes you somewhere and will also give us credibility outside our own immediate group. Now, I can sort of demonstrate this in a way in that when I spoke about advertising, I got invited to advertising conferences. When I started speaking about behavioral economics, I got invited to 10 Downing Street and to government meetings and so forth. You can actually take this conversation to far more places than you can take the, the sort of argot and language of marketing itself.
It's of much, much broader interest. It's even in its very small way a kind of rock and roll. Books such as Nudge, books such as Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational and so forth are actually bestsellers. And you will find people within your finance department who've read them and find them really, really interesting. A few of these words, availability. Famous things are easier to buy. We experience instinctively less discomfort buying something or doing something which we've heard of a lot. One of the things that suggests, actually, is that rather than always seeking to make your advertising persuasive, you should make your advertising distinctive. And this isn't me saying this, it's people like the late Ehrenberg, it's people like Byron Sharp, the author of the book How Brands Grow. Has anybody read that? Extremely good book, published by Oxford University Press. Make things distinctive. We are also much more likely to do things if we think other people are doing them. To a huge extent, we are a copying species, our actions, subconsciously, are actually determined by imitation. You can do experiments with rats where you feed them two diets. And then they have a mixed diet of, let's say, grapes and oats. And then after a few weeks, you put poison in the food, not so it kills them, because that would be nasty, but poison that makes them feel a bit ill. They stop eating. They think something's gone wrong with one of these two foods. If you then introduce into the cage rats that have been eating oats and which smell of oats on their breath, the other ill rats immediately take the lead and start eating the oats again. We see the be behaviour in other people as evidence of its safety, evidence of its coolness, evidence of all manner of things. But we are, to a huge extent, a copying species. You can do an experiment with chimpanzees where you put them in a cage and you put bananas all around the cage, including a very nice set of bananas that hangs from the top of the cage, which can only be reached by a stepladder. You let the chimpanzees eat the bananas. The only exception being that if any chimpanzees go up the stepladder and try and get the best bananas at the top, you fire at them with a high-pressure water hose. I mean, I don't know how the scientists devised this, you know, I should ask for permission for this experiment. Very quickly, the chimpanzees stop going up the stepladder, because they've learned, I get fired on by a jet of water. That's not particularly surprising, that's Pavlov. What's really interesting is if you introduce new chimpanzees into the cage, who've never seen the fire hose in operation, they don't go up the stepladder either. If you want to know why introducing new products into the market is so goddamn difficult, that's part of the reason. One thing you can do with products is make them very visible and noticeable. The white earbuds on the iPod or on the iPhone were noticeable. And they fooled our brain, probably because we noticed them, into thinking there were far more iPods in circulation than there really were. In the UK, we have Boris bikes. Very good idea. It's named after the Mayor of London. You can rent a bike for a limited period of time. Uh, actually, I think it's free for half an hour, 50 pence for the next half hour, and so forth. One of the very good ideas about these bikes is they look very strange. So you notice them. There's an equally good car scheme, which is a car club called Streetcar. You almost certainly have it in Sweden because you're early adopters and everything. Am I right? You have got a sort of car sharing scheme in Stockholm where you can book a car for three hours over the web. I think the mistake they made is they bought plain blue coloured Volkswagen Golfs. Nobody notices them in amongst 50 other parked cars. If they'd painted their cars pink, I think they'd be a more successful business. Availability norms, social norms, really, really matter. Signalling. This is a Darwinian phrase, that partly we do it, we use brands to signal something about our own personality. Qualities like intelligence and the big five personality traits. Uh, a book by Geoffrey Miller, professor at Albuquerque, called Spent, is very good on Darwinian psychology applied to consumerism. Um, there are also things like... Um, uh, which, again, are instinctive, which is advertising is the brander's bond, which is when a consumer buys a product from a well-known brand, subconsciously they are reassured by the idea that actually because the owner of that brand has invested over many years and many billions of dollars to build his reputation, he has far more to lose by selling an inferior product than he would make in terms of short-term gain. 
Now, that's game theory. What's weird about it is that as consumers, we actually seem to deploy it subconsciously. It's quite sophisticated game theory. We are naturally more comfortable buying from people with resources to spare because we believe those people are not desperate and therefore are more likely to concern about long, concerned about long-term considerations like reputation and therefore will make an effort to be honest and provide us with value. If we believe someone we're buying from is desperate, that's why a shabby restaurant is so terrifying to eat in. Because if that guy is close to going bankrupt, Actually, he may be so desperate for money, he's not that bothered about whether I get ill or not from eating his food. It's why, by the way, tourist restaurants are always rubbish. Because the reputational device doesn't apply, because until something like TripAdvisor came along, you had no repeat business. Therefore, it was not in the interests of a restaurant, a tourist restaurant, to provide particularly good food. Because they had no chance of repeat business anyway. They had very little chance of reputational damage. You know, I don't get back from my holiday and say it was a great holiday, except for the restaurant at number 23 so-and-so street, which was bad. You know, now, that game theory that we understand, which is, you know, what has the person selling me this product got to lose by selling me something that's bad, plays massively in our heads. It is why brands command such a large price premium. But actually, we're, when we're researched, we're not consciously aware of it. Heuristics and biases, I'll talk about later. Framing and comparison, I'll also talk about la later. Immediacy, it's simply worth knowing that the decisive part of the brain is disproportionately excited by the here and now, rather than by the long-term consequences of actions. Therefore, you can actually fail to sell someone a pension because the form is boring and unpleasant to fill in. It seems extraordinary. If you're a classical economist, this stuff drives you crazy. Because you say the pension is a very important decision, the boringness and un unattractiveness of the form is very trivial. Yes, but the form is now and the pension is tomorrow. We are disproportionately affected by immediate cues. And I'll talk about loss. Now, all of these things have come from different parts of uh, what I'd call the new psychology. Behavioral economics really enjoyed its, its great defining moment when, in 2002, Professor Daniel Kahneman was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics. What's interesting about that is Kahneman is not an economist. He has no qualification in economics at all. He's a very good mathematician, as it happens. He's actually a psychologist. And that's the really significant thing that this discipline is recognized for its importance at the highest level of economics and at the highest level of academia. Now, signaling. We over-obsess about persuasion because we think in our conscious brains that we make decisions consciously and rationally. We do very, very occasionally, but not as much as we think. As one beautiful writer about this said, the conscious brain is not the oval office of human decision-making, it's the press office. <laughs> it's the thing that issues an explanation for a decision that was taken somewhere down in the basement five minutes earlier. It, we're very, very good at constructing narratives and post-rationalizations that make sense of things. How accurate a representation of our actual decision-making this is, is open to question. David Ogilvy said about market research, he said, the trouble with market research is that people don't think what they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. <laughs> That's a little bit of the problem we face. But actually, we think we're persuaded. We think we decide through persuasion. Persuasion is a very, very bad way of getting people to do anything. If you ever hear someone say, I persuaded her to sleep with me, or I persuaded him to sleep with me, it's not indicative of a great relationship, is it? Seduction is the best means of changing behavior, which means getting the person to change their behavior, believing that it was their decision to change. And seduction and persuasion are not actually variants of each other. I would argue that in many ways they are opposites. That actually, you know, we, if you look at political arguments, all of you will have had political arguments with some of your best friends that date back 20 years. I don't think under, in all those hours and hours of arguing, anybody's got anybody to say, you're absolutely right. Okay? Argument satisfies some, some of our needs, it's spectacularly ineffective. And yet, dangerously, when we research advertising, we often look at its persuasive component as if that's what really matters. 
What really matters is whether you think the person presenting the argument is a nice guy or a wanker. That's the kind of thing that really operates on our decision-making. Signaling. Again, advertising arguably needs to be expensive in order to work, because the very expense of the thing is a demonstration of your commitment. If you invest in advertising, it's unlikely, having invested £5 million in advertising a product, that, that you're going to launch that product when it's rubbish. The peacock's tail is meaningful to female peacocks, because it says that this peacock actually has invested a huge amount of spare resources in creating this tail. He can still function as a peacock, despite this unbelievable decorative burden on his back. That's what you call, actually, self-handicapping. It's why, actually, expensive luxury goods have to be impractical. If women were merely attracted to men with expensive vehicles, they'd all chase truck drivers. But the truck has no signalling value because it's actually useful. In order to demonstrate that you're wealthy, you have to buy a completely impractical two-seater red sports car with no luggage capacity at all. <laughs> that actually expense that the consumption of resources is a vital part of signalling. Because why should I believe what you say? I believe it because you've spent a lot of money and effort saying it. That's why the engagement ring works. How can I believe that you're actually going to stick around for more than a few weeks? Well, the indication that you're prepared to make a heavy upfront investment <laughs> is, in game theory, a very good indication that at least your intentions are long-term. And advertising is an engagement ring to the customer. It's a signal that I have invested spectacularly up front with the, the not unreasonable result that you will believe, having made this upfront significant investment, that I'm actually going to stick around. It's why architectural permanence in banks, they always had lots of marble and lots of oak, because it said, having spent all this money on, on this building, it's not worth me skipping town just for the sake of your thousand dollars. By the way, one of the reasons, incidentally, that the... Um, uh, the wedding ring, the engagement ring, has meaning to women, uh, it's also true of flowers, is precisely because men don't like flowers or jewellery. So if you buy your wife or your girlfriend or your fiancé expensive flowers or expensive jewellery, there is very little suspicion of self-interest. Whereas if you buy her a new PS3, for example, or a series of computer games, there is the dangerous suspicion that you actually bought them for yourself. <laughs> With jewellery and flowers, that suspicion does not exist. But it's a vital thing that actually in many ways that brand advertising exists partly to be expensive. It actually says, having invested all this stuff, you can assume that my business intentions and my business behavior are those of a long-term player seeking to play the long game, not someone trying to make a quick buck. I'll, no, I won't skip this. Um, this is a vital insight that comes from Herbert Simon at Carnegie Mellon University. He created the phrase, satisficing. Most decisions are not taken on the basis of how can I optimize this decision. They're taken on the basis of what can I be sure is pretty good and not rubbish. That fear, in many purchase decisions, place, play, places a far more active role than desire. Why is it, and a lot of people are baffled by this, why is it that McDonald's is the most successful restaurant chain in the world, whereas in no town in the world is McDonald's the best restaurant? The reason is, in no town in the world is McDonald's the worst restaurant. What McDonald's scores fantastically on is an incredibly low level of disappointment. Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, said that what people, don't, what people want isn't the best burger in the world, it's a burger just like the one they had last time. The minimization of unpleasant surprises is an extraordinarily strong uh, force in human behavior. We actually feel mild disappointment almost as a form of pain. Therefore, if we can avoid it, Something that is actually sure to be pretty good is more important and more popular as a decision than something that might be perfect. I can demonstrate this perfectly. I, I always ask people this question, what's the best meal you've ever had in your life in a restaurant? And they always cite this little place in Rome or this place they went to once in Paris. Or, you know, there's a place in London, I had this meal back in 1993. And I always ask the same question, and how often have you been back to that restaurant? And they always say, never or once. And I asked the question, well, if you're a maximizer, you know, don't you think you go back a bit more often? Now, there are 
categories and people and moments in which people maximize. If you're a motorbike enthusiast or you're choosing a restaurant for your 50th wedding anniversary, you will maximize because you want to maximize the symbolic value of whatever it is you're buying in the case of the meal. If you're a motorbike fan, all your friends are bikers, you spend two hours a day reading bike magazines. That's the kind of decision where you are trying to maximize. Most of the time, we're trying to avoid disappointment. The brand attribute of not crap may be more important in commanding a premium than the brand attribute of slightly better. This is another reason why it's very difficult to enter a new market, because most markets are already occupied by people who are pretty satisfied with what they already have. There are cases where you can change this, but actually, good enough is pretty damn good. One thing that economics explains, actually, is that most purchases we make are much more asymmetric than we think. When you buy a television, you pay for the money up front, you only know whether that television's been good value for money about four or five years later when it's still working. At that point, you can confidently say, I'm glad I bought that TV. Um, actually, a pension, you only discover it's any good 40 years later. A meal in a restaurant, arguably, you only discover three hours later whether you've got food poisoning or not. We take an upfront risk with nearly all our purchases. Minimizing that upfront risk, what's called asymmetry, is really, really important to us. The problem about all this stuff is it never appears in research. Nobody in research is aware of this. They talk about themselves as if they're maximizers. How can I get the best possible thing for my money? And that's because the conscious brain thinks it's a maximizer. You're not. I'll skip heuristics very quickly, but just, just move on to another field. Um, heuristics are rules of thumb we use to make decisions, which simplify decisions. Um, one of them would be when you choose a wine, you choose from the third one up from the bottom of the wine list. If you're presented with three items, a cheap one, a medium-priced one, and an expensive one, many people, much of the time, will deploy the heuristic, I'll buy the one in the middle. Um, choice architecture, I'll skip, but um, framing is our... Perception is relativistic. 3,000 euros on the trading price for your car is a vastly more successful offer, it appears, than 3,000 euros off the purchase price. Why? Because by comparison with the trade-in price, it seems like a bigger amount of money than it does when knocked off the purchase price. This helped one car brand in, the U in Germany sell 20,000 extra cars by realizing this framing effect. Um, context is important to our perception of value. We pay two pounds for a coffee on the street, we pay two pence for a coffee at home. Um, we, why is this? The reason is all our perception, temperature, value, heat, pleasure, pitch, volume, virtually every, every sense we have works on a relativistic basis. Perfect pitch for two or three percent of people is a tiny exception. Have a look at this. A is the dark square, B is the light square. Of course, A is much darker than B. Until I actually show you in a proper context, when you'll actually see that in reality, they are exactly the same color. But when I return to the context, it's now impossible for you to see that again. That's because our brain works at a relative level. It works by comparison. Here's a uniform gray strip, and it is a uniform gray strip until I change the context. Now it's darker at the right than it is at the left. That's how the brain works. We work by comparison. One of the most successful businesses is this. Why? It's an unbelievably expensive, though very, very good way of getting coffee. If you had to buy coffee for the machine in a jar like Nescafe, it would be like paying about £150 for a large jar of Nescafe. You couldn't bring yourself to do it. Because you buy the coffee in small pods, your frame of reference isn't Nescafe, it's Starbucks. And you go, well, it's 28p for one of these pods. I'd pay a pound for a shot of coffee at Starbucks. The machine's practically paying for itself. We make decisions about price and value according to a comparative frame, which in some cases is quite arbitrary. I've made an interesting debate, which is when you want planning permission for an airport, what people always do is they offer compensation to the owner of the house. They say, we'll give you £200,000 to compensate you for the noise. The frame of reference is what they think their house is worth. They think their house is worth a million pounds. That's rubbish, okay? I think if you offer to pay people compensation of £20,000 a year, it might actually be less money, but their frame of reference is suddenly their annual salary rather than the value of their house. They think that's a generous offer. 
I'll show you a few more examples. Um, relativistic, uh, this was missold. The, the, the video conferencing technology was sold as the poor man's air travel. It should have been sold as the rich man's phone call. It was so, sold as margarine to the butter of British Airways. It should have been sold as an upgrade to your phone system. That's because we think comparatively. Coach travel suffers massively because it's the poor man's rail travel. We think, again, we look for a close comparison and we go better or worse. To be honest, Coke needs Pepsi. Being alone in your category doesn't help. We need comparison to decide. This is infinite music for $9.99 a month. I've suggested to them, don't make it infinite. Nobody knows what infinite music's worth. It's like me going to you and saying, would you like to buy my unicorn? Well, what sort of price should I pay for that? If I said 200 tracks a month maximum, you go, that's about 20 CDs, that's worth about 250, 300 pounds. Gosh, 9.99 is a bargain. But infinite, I don't know what infinite music is worth. I can't make a comparison. Here's what people buy in lagers in the store. Uh, just have the two in the middle, £1 and £2. 67% buy the £2 one, 33% buy the £1 one. Add a 30p bargain lager. Nobody buys it, but now 47% of people defaulting to the middle buy the cheaper one, 53% buy the more expensive. Get rid of the cheap lager, add a £4 bottle French lager. 10% of people buy that, 90% of people buy the £2 one. No one buys the one on the left. That's a framing effect. It's a comparative effect. It's vitally important. If you're an airline, do not judge the profitability of your first-class cabin on how much money you make from first-class passengers. You also need to factor in the number of people who are now flying business class because of the existence of a first class. Um, if you want to sell Rolls Royces, don't sell them at car shows. It looks ridiculously expensive. You sell them at yacht shows and jet shows. If you've been looking at Lear jets all afternoon at $20 million each, on your way out, you see, a car, you see that and you go, $350,000, I have a couple of those. <laughs> right? Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he started off in California, exploited this brilliantly. People don't want a brilliant deal. They want to feel they're getting a better deal. And Schwarzenegger and his partner, another bodybuilder, worked in building in California. And they'd go, and some guy would say, I want to build a wall. And his, guy, his partner, although he was Italian, spoke German. And in the middle, they'd just start arguing in German in front of this guy who didn't understand what they were saying. And the guy would say, what are you arguing about? You're getting really angry. And he says, oh, you know, my partner, he's Italian. He wants to charge you too much, but I think I can do this for less. Now, the price he actually quoted was still quite high, but it was comparatively lower. So that's, that's the vital thing. I'll, I'll more or less come to an end now. Um, very small things. Logic won't tell you this. Research won't tell you this. Much of this stuff is actually hardwired. It's on the human motherboard. It's not on the software. And a final problem, our behavior actually precedes our attitudes in many cases. We do things instinctively, and then we post-rationalize. This is why if a man says, my wife doesn't understand me, it doesn't mean he's planning an affair, it means he's already had one. <laughs> um, what doesn't happen with men is you don't go, actually, I've noticed declining levels of empathy in my wife, and I think I might outsource a range of sexual services to some competing providers. Well, you do if you work for Accenture, but otherwise you probably don't, okay? What happens is someone gets drunk at a party, they snog someone they never intended to snog, and in a desperate attempt to make sense of their actions, they build a completely bogus case against their wife. This is von Mises on the left, Kahneman on the right. Two heroes, and I think I'll very quickly, and this is my last slide, give you a reading list on this fantastic topic. The final promise is, take this stuff to your finance guy, he'll absolutely love it and you'll actually discover a new best friend. It's not often I used to go and hang out in the Ogilvy Finance Department until I discovered behavioral economics. Funnily enough, they're even more interested in this stuff than we are. It's a tremendous way to actually have a language which takes marketing and its business importance into the boardroom rather than just talking astrology among ourselves. Thanks very much indeed.